You know, sometimes it's, it's hard to distinguish between illusion and reality. When we're younger, we take it for granted that we see what we see, and objects in the world in front of us uh, are precisely as we see them. And then, of course, as time goes on, we have more and more doubt about that. Uh, as you would call, going back to when you were younger, I'm sure everyone in this room had the feeling when they were a child, it was impossible for you to conceive of dying, so you assumed more or less that you'd continue to live forever, even though nobody did before. It was an illusion, a childish illusion, but one which most people have. Uh, of course, that goes with time, but other illusions continue to remain, and sometimes a government takes advantage of it. Uh, one illusion that stays, stays with us to a great extent, unless we have the good fortune or the misfortune, as the case may be, to have detachment. Another illusion is the idea that we're living in the best of all possible worlds. Uh, this is a, this is a favorite, uh, a favorite strategy of the of the fascist uh, type of government, totalitarian types of governments too, not just fascist, in order to keep the people from being restless. And uh, actually, you're seeing it applied, I think, rather systematically, in a number of areas in the government of the United States today. Uh, again and again, I, I think you are being assured that you are living in the best of all possible worlds. Again and again, you see different tactics being used to make the government's power lovable. Actually, there's nothing new about this. Uh, as early as the Roman Empire, and probably even before that, the patricians and their counterparts have found ways to make their power lovable so that they wouldn't have too much trouble from the plebeians. That's the problem, and it's in a sense here again today. But there's a duplicity in that. There's a duplicity in making power lovable uh, with false slogans and in making things appear to be better than they are, which I don't happen to like. For example, I am very conscious of seeing fascist tendencies in our government today. Uh, I suppose uh, that right now uh, that places me in the uh, FBI file under, uh, uh, I'm probably filed with a lot of other people being investigated under the title of anti-fascist activities, which is uh, derogatory files from Mr. Hoover's point of view. But this is, this is very relevant to the entire subject of the assassination. Let me go back, let me go back to the way things were about this time, just before the assassination. We had a young president who was showing signs increasingly of being a forceful president and a liberal president in the sense that he was going to make changes that had not been made before. And a very strong reaction was occurring in a number of places, particularly in areas such as Dallas, Texas. And this is not an indictment of the people of Dallas, but there are individuals in Dallas that have an unusually strong control over key individuals on the police force, which causes Dallas to be somewhat different than other cities. President Kennedy was also moving in the direction of doing away with a 27.5% deduction on the income tax for men in the oil business, which of course was, primary, was a primary concern to some individuals in Dallas. President Kennedy had reached a rapprochement of sorts with Premier Khrushchev of Russia and was in the process of reaching an understanding with Fidel Castro. I'm sure that it is possible to have a great many views on, on uh, the value of, uh, of these conclusions, these decisions that he had made, but the fact is that he was the president and he had made them and his basic objective was to try and minimize involvement in a war which would lead increasingly to escalation and more escalation until we finally involved in a 
hydrogen war, which is more or less the situation uh, in which we find ourselves today. Now, the reaction of a number of individuals, especially in certain areas of Texas, was that President Kennedy, in ending the Cuban adventures, in trying to reach an understanding with Khrushchev, in making statements such as he made in his speech before the American University on June 10th, that we breathe the same air as the Russians, which is perfectly true and should have been made and is something we don't think about very often. But the fact that he made these statements caused him to be regarded by a number of extreme individuals as a communist or a person selling out to the communists. So that there was a, there was a certain side of the spectrum of uh, essentially the extreme right-wing area, especially in southern states, that had a venomous attitude towards John Kennedy. Now this is just a brief, perhaps oversimplified summary of the situation as it existed when John Kennedy visited Dallas. Now with that background, let's now jump from reality into the world of illusion for a moment and will describe the official Lyndon Johnson administration version of what happened. It has no connection at all with reality. It has exactly as much substance as the story of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. <laughs> but it has the gold presidential seal on the outside, and that's good enough for NBC. <laughs> anyway, the official story is that every possible safeguard had been taken to protect the president. And he was proceeding down Elm Street, having made the turn from Houston, when from his lair in the sixth floor of the school book depository, a Marxist communist was crouched. I think, actually, uh, there's some difference between a Marxist and a communist, but it's, it doesn't really matter in fairy tales. You can make them the same thing. <laughs> so he's a Marxist communist, and he's crouched there with his man like a car candle. He fires three rapid shots, shots of fantastic marksmanship. And as a result, the president, of course, is killed, and the governor of Texas is wounded. And as I know Mark Lane has explained to you at some length, the, this is such an unusual rifle, and the ammunition is so unusual, that one bullet created seven different wounds and emerged in pristine shape. Uh, as a matter of fact, there was a delay of approximately a second and a half between the time that the bullet finished going through President Kennedy and began its journey through the governor. No matter, the, the president's seal was on the outside, and that was good enough for Newsweek. Anyway, this is the official version. In reality, what happened was this, and I'm going to have to be general for two reasons. One, because there are a great many things that I don't know about the assassination. I have never tried to pretend to know more than I do although I have read magazine articles which have me saying things I haven't said and indicating that I pretend to know more. But another reason I can't go into great detail is because some of the details we have would indicate uh, what would cause certain people to move from where they are and create certain problems for the rest of our investigation. But I can tell you generally what happened. Generally what happened was this. An elaborate conspiracy had been worked on for a very long time. There were three levels. Uh, of course, classification, as I know you well know, is an arbitrary thing. But for, for reasons of convenience, we classify, uh, we, we call it operating level, individuals pulling triggers, operating the radios, driving the cars, 
intermediate level individuals providing services such as uh, uh, David Ferry, Jack Ruby, and others, and then the sponsor level, uh, which I uh, can't go into in too much detail. That gets kind of high up. Uh, but those are the three general levels. Anyway, by the time the president made his turn, the men who were to kill him were set to go. There had to be no less than four basic points from which the shooting occurred. There had to be no less than four, and possibly five. I might add, before I even go into them, that anybody who has ever been at Dealey Plaza or has ever seen a picture of Dealey Plaza will know that if there was a lone assassin sitting in the sixth floor of the book depository, he would have had to have his shot at the president as the president approached slowly towards him on Houston Street. This was the best shot he would ever have. The fact that this was passed up indicates, along with many other things, that the lone assassin was not there. The reason they waited until the president had almost reached the sign was so that he was an essential point so that he could be hit from many directions. The objective was not to wound him, not to hit him several times, but to make sure that he was dead or dying before he reached the triple underpass so that there would be no danger of his surviving and having control of major investigative agencies such as the FBI. Because had he survived, and had he been in control of the FBI, every individual involved would have been caught by now. So it had to be assured that there was overkill. That's why you can't see the autopsy pictures. That's why no one can see them. That's why a pathologist selected by this community cannot look at them, because the autopsy pictures will show that President Kennedy was hit from a number of different directions. The autopsy pictures will show that he was hit in the front of the head at least twice. It will show that there's a hole in the president's forehead at the temple line, and it will show that the right side of his head has been torn off by a bullet coming from the right, and God knows how many other wounds, but at least two from the front. And you aren't supposed to see that because you are supposed to be dutiful Americans and believe the fairy tale of the lone assassin because that's what the president wants you to believe. But in order for you to believe that, you cannot see the autopsy picture. Now, even as I point this out, I must caution you, and this may be hard for some of you to accept, but please believe me, I've never been more sincere. I am sure that if the government is able to accomplish it, it will one day reproduce autopsy pictures, which will appear to be autopsy pictures and support the lone assassin theory. I think they're having some technical problems. But I'm just trying to say that there is nothing they will not do. There is nothing they will not do. They didn't hesitate to kill Jack Kennedy in Dealey Plaza, and there is nothing they will not do. The operation, for all practical purposes, <clears throat> continues. <clears throat> you can see that again and again. We can, in the constant interference with our investigation, in witnesses being harassed, moved away, one thing after another, constant monitoring of telephones. What this means is that there is a unique interest on the part of high officials in our federal government in the truth being concealed from the American people. The significance of that I will go into a little further. I mentioned that there had to be four groups of shooters. There had to be a rifle firing from Houston Street either from the Records Building or the Dialtex Building. I think that most of the serious critics are, are in harmony 
about that by now because the shot that hit Governor Connolly was such an angle it could not have come from the from the book depository. It appears likely that there was shooting from the book depository, although it is obvious that Lee Oswald had nothing to do with it. He didn't shoot any weapons that day, and there's no indication that he was in any way involved in the assassination. As a matter of fact, the, uh, the indication is quite the opposite. It is very clear that there was shooting from the grassy knob, not only from behind the stone wall, but further back behind the picket fence, back towards the overpass area. As a matter of fact, on the day of the assassination, such a large percentage of the witnesses saw and heard the shooting from that area, heard I should use because there are only a few that saw, heard the shooting from that area, but it was taken for granted that the president was shot from the grass and all. It took about 24 hours before the official scenario had been issued and uh, the, the emphasis was put on shooting from the book depository, shooting from the book depository. But the, 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 the main bulk of the shots came from the grassy knoll area, and 60% of the witnesses in Dealey Plaza heard those shots. And we have talked to at least one person that, is, that uh, was in the grassy knoll area and saw one of the men behind the stone wall. And other witnesses have seen the men afterwards running away behind, from behind the stone wall, throwing something into the back of a car and driving off at a rapid rate of speed. Of course, these things were rather irrelevant, so they weren't brought into the Warren Commission hearing. This is what happened. Now, the last uh, uh, apparent shooting place is something that we have come across recently, several months ago. And uh, you may have seen it. It got some attention from the news services, which is, uh, was a surprise to us. And I'll just mention it in passing. If you're interested and in, 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 uh, want to ask uh, questions, I'll go into it more later. But it appears that the subsurface drainage system in Dealey Plaza was also used. Dealey Plaza used to be a residential area. They had a lot of houses there before they removed the houses and cleared it out to make this incredibly beautiful plaza with this, uh, these instant Mussolini arcades and uh, all these beautiful pergolas and things that you've seen in pictures. Prior to that, there were many houses, so there had to be a drainage system. Well, the drainage system is a rather complete one, and it's an interconnecting maze of tunnels, the narrowest 15 inches wide, the largest 30 inches wide, through which men can crawl. For example, one of the entrances to the tunnel system is behind the grassy knob. You lift up a, a three by three foot uh, grate and you find yourself going down into an entrance and it's got tunnel ways leading in several directions. If you go south towards Elm Street, then you will find yourself in one of the sewers, which is alongside of Elm Street. The sewers that go alongside of Elm, Maine, and Commerce look to the person riding in a car just as uh, about six inch high slits into which the drainage goes. But actually inside, these are like concrete pillboxes. They're approximately five and a half feet deep. And a man standing inside can easily see into the back of a convertible. We had one of our investigators get in uh, inside in Dallas one morning. We had him get in before dark. Uh, because we were afraid that if, uh, you know, if the wrong people saw him get in, he might be cemented in there and we'd never see him again. <laughs> so I just heard recently, just after we, we really found the, the application and the likelihood that this sewer system was used, and I'll give you an example of why it appears to be used, that, uh, that uh, Dallas is planning to dig up this entire area in Dealey Plaza, the entire sewer system, and create a great underground parking garage. And uh, uh, the name of it is supposed to be the John F. Kennedy Parking Garage. <clears throat> well, if I, had not, if I had not had a single thought 
about the possibility of a sewer system having used, been used before, this would have aroused my curiosity because this is just about the last bit of physical evidence that remains at the scene. There's been a pattern of destroying and removing and shifting everything, and I wouldn't be surprised that what this was related to it. On the other hand, it might be entirely a coincidence. Anyway, <clears throat> the sewer system, the, uh, the closeness of these sewers to a man riding in a convertible down Elm Street becomes very significant when you consider that there was a bullet found on the south side of Elm Street in the neutral ground. It landed on its base among pieces of the president's head. We have photographs of the bullet, and in the photograph you see Deputy Sheriff Buddy Walters of Dallas smoking a cigarette looking down at the bullet, and you see a Dallas policeman firmly standing on top of a manhole cover which leads down into the sewer system. I don't know why he's standing there at this time, but it would be kind of hard to get in there if he was standing there. And the, the clock over their shoulder shows that it is 12.40. This picture was taken 10 minutes after John Kennedy was shot, and his heart was still beating when the third man in the picture, who appears to be a federal agent, although we are unable to identify him because there's no way to get any kind of cooperation from the federal government, is picking up the 45 caliber bullet. The size of the bullet has been identified by comparison with uh, uh, real bullets, and there's no question about the fact that this is the 45 caliber bullet which landed on its base among pieces of the president's head. Now, this was never admitted into evidence in the Warren Commission, nor was it ever mentioned in the Warren Commission in any way. In fact, they pretended that there was a great mystery. No bullets were ever found except number 399, which was found at the hospital, the bullet to which they consigned the seven different wounds. Now, the 45 caliber, although it was in the picture and is being picked up, is being looked at by Sheriff Buddy Walters, has now ceased to exist officially because it creates a problem for the federal government. It's not possible to shoot a 45 caliber bullet from a 6.5 man liquor car panel. The official fairy tale says that Oswald was the lone assassin, therefore it is necessary for this bullet to become a non-bullet. And already Sheriff Buddy Walters has replied when we made the photograph available that uh, he doesn't think he found a bullet. You know, it's kind of hard to remember. It's a lot of things happening that day, and you can't remember whether you found a 45 bullet sitting there or not. He doesn't think he found a bullet. Well, today we released, and I hope it makes the news services out here, we released a copy of a correspondence between two members of the Warren Commission, two attorneys, and one of them is referring to the fact that Sheriff Buddy Walters originally had said that he found a bullet, but now had backed off from it, asking him to question about it further. So this is one situation in which finally the federal government has been caught. They have told so many lies, one lie after the other, new lies to keep the old lies, the old lies alive. This is one time when we have finally caught them. It's one thing to know that they've lied, and anyone who has read the Warren Report or Mark Lane's work or Harold Weisberg's looked into it has to know that his government is lying to him rather systematically, at least in this area, and if in this area, God knows how many other areas. But here we finally have them caught. The bullet is so clear, we knew they would say that bullet is not a bullet, so we held off with the letter describing the deputy sheriff's statement. And now we have the Warren Commission records and a photograph to show that the federal government did find and conceal a 45 caliber bullet, caliber bullet that was certainly involved in the assassination of the president. This is very significant because it means in terms of overwhelming probability that not just the command of the FBI, 
But Lyndon Johnson himself had to know before the sun set that evening that among the bullets which killed John Kennedy, there was a 45 caliber bullet. It means that Lyndon Johnson had to know when Oswald was arrested, among other things, for being the assassin of the president, that he could not have fired that 45 caliber bullet. And it means that Lyndon Johnson had to know that when Oswald was executed by Jack Ruby, that they, the assassins were simply getting rid of a patsy, a man who might tell about what really happened. But I haven't heard a word yet from Lyndon Johnson about the 45 caliber bullet, which his employee found at 1240. It means furthermore, that even before the Warren Commission was appointed, the command of the FBI and the President of the United States had to know there were a number of people shooting at John Kennedy and that the Dallas police scenario was completely false. And in the final analysis, it means that every one of these honorable men, without any exception, prostituted himself let his country down, let you down, by participating in an absolute fraud, knowing that it was a complete lie. Yes. Are you referring to the recent the Thompson, Josiah Thompson article in the Post? All right. Let me answer that question first. The Professor Thompson's article, I think, is a very scholarly presentation of, uh, of what the major critics, uh, Maggie Field of Los Angeles and, and uh, uh, Mark Lane and Harold Weisberg have contended for some years. I, I think it was a very effective presentation, and I think uh, that the major points are, without any question, true. I think possibly you could argue about details, like his conclusion about bullet 399, but I think it is a serious contribution, uh, particularly because of the careful way that he has shown that not many alternatives remain, but to assume that there were at least three shooting positions. Now, with regard to Life magazine, uh, which articles are you talking about? The articles that say I'm tied in with the mafia? Uh, or is there some? I stopped reading Life about that time. I haven't read it since. <laughs> uh, there was, uh, I think it was last, uh, the last week of the week before, a series of uh, photographs of the very people who had Life magazine rendered a serious service to this, to this country uh, a year ago in its anniversary issue when it had an article entitled A Matter of Reasonable Doubt. And it helped lead the way in re-examining the assassination of John Kennedy. Uh, I don't want to uh, rashly criticize life because God knows what kind of pressures are coming from the White House now the management of Life magazine. Uh, I'm sure it's nothing less than that. I think in the long run that the editors of Life are concerned about the truth, uh, like the editors of uh, other magazines. But the only thing I can say about the last article, which is really nothing but a bland presentation of pictures, is that uh, Right now, uh, for reasons which I don't understand, life is not in the battle. But I hope that we see them there again, because God knows we sure need them. Any other questions? Right here.
Uh, are you saying, how do I conclude that Oswald did not shoot uh, the president? Is that all right? Well, first of all, there is no evidence that he did. Uh, normally, um, when you are going to charge someone with a crime, you are required to present evidence that he did do it, and the defense does not have to pre present evidence that he did not. Uh, nevertheless, I will ask, act as his, as his defense counsel and give you a few examples of uh, evidence indicating he did not. The uh, examination of the rifle for fingerprints did not produce fingerprints of Lee Harvey Oswald. The uh, indications that uh, fingerprints of Oswald were obtained and announced by some individuals in Dallas right after the assassination were, were untrue. The Federal Bureau of Investigation, which is the only sound fingerprint, uh, which is the soundest, rather, uh, laboratory in the country, found no fingerprints of Lee Oswald that it could identify on the gun, on the rifle. Secondly, Oswald was given the nitrate test, which is a very effective test. Uh, if you fire a rifle, uh, it leaves traces of nitrate on your cheek. If you fire with it on your right side, your right cheek will have traces of nitrate. If you fire it on your left side, your left side will have traces of nitrate. Oswald was exonerated by the nitrate test, which indicated that he did not fire a rifle. Uh, I, I might say that the evidence exonerating Oswald is so complete that had he lived, they could not have had a trial. They would not have dared to come to trial. He had to be executed. And uh, then you had to have fraudulent uh, commission like the, Os the, the, the Warren Commission to make it appear that he, he did these things when he wasn't even ever seen. A third, the rifle man like a car kennel, was not even tested to see if it had been fired that day, with very good reason, since it apparently had not been fired that day. Fourth, Oswald was not a very good shot, and there is no acceptable evidence that he had ever shot a rifle since he left the Marines. The last time he shot in the Marines, he just barely qualified as marksman, and there's no indication that he shot since. Fifth, the telescopic sight on his man liquor carcano had never been in his, the sailor's his, had never been adjusted since the shipment. And before they test fired it, they bore sighted it and aligned it because you could not fire it. The, the, the sight was out of line with the tube of the gun. Uh, furthermore, it was a physical impossibility for Oswald to get downstairs in that short of time, especially if he had to wipe off the fingerprints and hide the gun under the boxes, go from the sixth to the fifth, to fifth to the fourth, to fourth to the third, to third to the second, in the same time that Roy Truly and Marion Baker went from the first to the second. Uh, furthermore, during the time that he is supposed to have come down, and if he had been able to do that, he would have been the decathlon champion of all time. If he had been able to do that, but he he, he couldn't possibly. Now, incidentally, uh, one interesting thing is, in conducting their test to see if he could do it, this is typical of the, of the type of, of tactics the federal government used. They found, in, in, in Marion Baker's testimony, he's the officer who saw Oswald on the second floor drinking a Coke, they found that if the man ran fast enough, I think they got somebody from uh, some track star from recent... Uh, track events and had him running down the steps, they found that they could get him down there at maximum speed to reach the Coke machine, but could not get the Coke out of the Coke machine. <laughs> Honest, this is true. So what they did was they brought back Marion Baker and had him re-examine his written statement. And now if you look at it in the exhibits in the Warren Commission, you will see where he is scratched out and was drinking a Coke. That's scratched out. That's what is known as rewriting history to make it confirm to the official fairy tale. Uh, to uh, get to another part of the forest, um, Tippett was shot. Well, I might add one more thing. As a matter of fact, at the time of the shooting, 
You'll see this in the November 22nd issue of, of the Dallas Times Herald. One of the men who ran the book depository went inside immediately after the assassination and happened to see Lee Oswald on the first floor. This is before he went up to get a coat. So I'm on the first floor. Well, this isn't too useful to the lone assassin theory, so this was never mentioned again. In other words, he was never hired in the second and was apparently on the first floor at the time of the assassination. A physical impossibility from many points of view. Uh, Tippett shooting, well, furthermore, the, the uh, witness, uh, the only witness they were able to find, and the hundreds of people there, Mr. Brennan, who was finally willing to say that he saw Oswald at the window, initially insisted it was not Oswald. But he finally agreed it was, and they had their witness. But that's all they could get out of hundreds of people. On the other hand, more than one person saw several individuals up there on the sixth floor. So it, it, any, any serious examination of the Dealey Plaza uh, picture eliminates Oswald as a possibility of any kind. The same is true with regard to Officer Tippett. Uh, Officer Tippett was killed by two men who alighted from a car. When they left, one went left in the car and the other left running. Both of them were black-headed. Neither one looked the slightest bit like Lee Oswald. As a matter of fact, they found a mixture of shells on the ground. Afterwards, one was uh, an automatic shell, and uh, several were shells and revolvers, which would have suggested to the average reasonable man that there were two men, unless Oswald was supposed to have had an automatic in one hand and a revolver in the other. Uh, furthermore, Oswald could not possibly have made it time-wise uh, if you use the time standard by the main state witness. Furthermore, the, the uh, test of the 38 for fingerprints indicated that there were no fingerprints on it at all. Now that was excluded from the Warren Commission because of the scandalous implications of that. We obtained that from the Texas investigation. We got a copy of the Texas investigation found in it that this 38 Smith & Wesson which Oswald is supposed to have used to kill Tippett, and then at running down the street, pulling the shells out, putting in new shells. Then later at the Texas Theater, he's wrestling with the officers, and he tries to kill one, and it doesn't go off, and they're pulling him, and they get the gun. It doesn't have one fingerprint on it. Isn't that unbelievable? Even the Warren Commission didn't have the stomach to introduce that. So anyway, we could go on and on, but uh, uh, considering, to begin with, that the prosecution has the burden of proof, uh, I submit as uh, a defense counsel in this instance that it's, it's apparent in terms of probability that Oswald was not involved in the shooting at all. Little boy right there. Three questions, if I understand them. One, how many bullets were shot uh, at President Kennedy, or how many was he hit with? Uh, secondly, uh, how many persons do I think shot at him? And third, were any bullets of the uh, 6.5 caliber found in the President's body? It's a little hard to say anything about the autopsy because Commander Humes, who performed the autopsy, uh, burned his autopsy notes and was subsequently promoted. <laughs> That's true. Uh, I know a deputy sheriff in Dallas, on the other hand, who told the truth and stuck to it, and he's not a deputy sheriff anymore. But Commander Humes burned his autopsy notes, and he's been promoted, and as a result, there's no way to know of uh, just where the president was hit or what his autopsy notes really had in them. Uh, if we were able to look at the photographs, the autopsy photographs, we would know how many times he was hit and where. That's a very good question and was the first question before the Warren Commission and yet they did not have the stomach to look at the autopsies because they knew what they would see. 
So we don't know either because Lyndon Johnson administration is still keeping it secret. Now, as to how many are involved, uh, we'll see the operating group at the scene. I would have to speculate, and I don't like to speculate there. We have uh, names of some individuals who have participated, uh, I think largely as a result of luck, but we have the names of, of some of them. Uh, most of them did not pass to our jurisdiction, and we don't quite know what to do with the names right now. Can you imagine if we turn it over to the federal government? Uh, to get a promotion. The, uh, uh, one man that we've identified as being involved in the assassination uh, works at a military base. Uh, a number of witnesses uh, in the New Orleans area that have lied consistently and refused to tell the truth. Uh, the government has obtained jobs for them at Chrysler or, or Boeing. Uh, you'd be amazed how many people that work for the Roddy Coffee Company that now work for Chrysler or Boeing that have suddenly developed an interest in the defense effort. But th there's no way to, to estimate how many are involved except to say a hell of a lot because they obviously were using transistor radios for communication. They had at least one man transmitting as to the point where the presidential route was. They had to use at least four, possibly five routes, uh, five points of shooting, and they obviously had to use uh, scouts and uh, individuals to uh, stand to the side and uh, keep an eye open. So I'd say uh, uh, at least 10 or 15. I'll tell you what may give you a rough guide. If I were to ask you all tonight if anybody had been arrested at Dealey Plaza for the assassination of John Kennedy, you'd probably say certainly not. But the fact is that they arrested 10 men. 10. Try and get their names. You can't get their names because obviously a few things went wrong and the police stumbled across some of the men who were involved. Sometimes, some days, things just don't go right. <laughs> this was the probable reason for the shooting of Officer Tippett, because if you study the radio logs, you see a continual reference to individuals uh, running back in the railroad yards, another individual being seen by Cobb Stadium with a rifle, uh, other individuals uh, getting out of cars with rifles and so forth. Citizens are pointing these things out. Suddenly, Officer Tippett is killed. Immediately, there's no more interest in Dealey Plaza. All attention turns to Oak Cliff. When these men were turned loose, nobody asked a question or thought about it for several years. We're trying to get the names of some of them. We've located photographs of some of them, and we've made some identifications. But I can assure you there's no help from the, from the Dallas Police Department, and even less from the federal government.